Hello and welcome to this video on cannibalism and why it is bad. Eating the flesh of another human being is surprisingly relatively uncommon in the world at present. Although few consume the liver of another with fava beans and a nice Chianti, there are exceptions. The practices range from ritualistic to subsistence in nature. There have been a few cases of people with a morbid curiosity, but the legality widely varies by country and when the act occurred. Cannibalism can and generally will cause complications if practiced over an extended period. Across most of the world, cannibalism is not normal. There are some situations and some cultures where it is conducted as a practice. As a general rule though, the practices themselves fall into two categories, necrocannibalism, that is eating those who are already deceased, and those which are homicidal cannibals, killing someone in order to eat them. In general, the law views these very differently. In at least one case we have well studied is the Four Tribes of New Guinea. They have unfortunately developed a widespread prion disease problem. This is known as Ku. The Four have a funerary or mortuary cannibalistic practice. And this was documented for quite a long time, and we understand why they did it, what they did, and how it was done. This was very widely practiced before we understood what prion diseases are. There have been some arguments within scholastic circles about whether or not what occurred was cannibalism or simply dismemberment. Either way, the evidence is there that at least at some point cannibalism was a common occurrence. There's also argument to be had that perhaps it only occurred along with the arrival of Europeans and famine, that they then decided to rationalise this as a religious rite at that time. There are other horrifying examples. These spread across the globe, some more modern in their history than others. For example, at least through the 16th to 18th century, executioners would often sell dismembered parts of their victims as a medicinal supplement, and that this was a common enough practice that we know of it through historical records. This was primarily seen in Germany. In the Matrix, the liquidification of the deceased and then feeding them to others is the norm. Cannibalism is jokingly described as a solution to the global food shortages we have now and will in the future. The reason it is a joking solution, and why at least Hollywood's depiction is so horrifying, owes to food safety. In some countries, there have not been and still are not any laws about cannibalism. It took very public and scandalous cases of cannibalism in Germany for it to become illegal. It took incidents multiple incidents in the UK for it to be illegal. In other countries, the act itself is not illegal, but interfering with the corpse is. This has left the door open for the laws to be abused or circumvented. This has not always been the case in all places. As was mentioned, particularly the four people of Papua New Guinea have been studied for their use of cannibalism. They practiced this up until the 1950s. The general depiction that's been accepted is that they ate the bodies of their relatives to free the spirit. There's a catch to this. The four people as a whole conducted this, and this meant they contracted Kuru. They also died from this. The name Kuru is a anglicization or perhaps borrowing of the word for shaking from the four people. Some of them fell ill, while some of them have not, but over the last 200 years there has been a general inheritance or acquisition of this disease. Interestingly, some of them have developed genetic mutations that protect them from prions within the Kuru version of the disease, but not others. Kuru is one among a number of prion diseases. Prion diseases are a special kind of protein that begin a cascade of events that are largely irreversible. They lead to several different conditions, but one of the most well-known is Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. A prion is a 
special type of protein that can trigger that cascade we mentioned of normal proteins in the brain folding abnormally. This is the prion disease at its start. It will then continue throughout the other proteins in its proximity, moving from one to the next. It can affect both humans and other animals. Worryingly, it can also spread from humans to animals or from infected animal meat products to humans. This leads to something around the 300 cases per year in the United States of America. In the 90s, there was a major outbreak in the United Kingdom, and that required the wholesale slaughter of cattle and fundamentally made everyone a possible carrier of human-to-human -human transmittable prion diseases. And this is one reason why, for instance, some countries will not let those of UK origin donate blood in case they spread the disease. There are a variety of Cotswold-Yakov disease variants. The one we're going to talk about here primarily relates to that is, which is acquired. Understand, there's both sporadic mutation and inherited versions. But what we are going to describe here is how somebody who could either be exposed to through either surgery, food, or even simply exposure to, say, processing in a meat plant, might come into contact with infected material, they would then have that material into their body and begin affecting all of the proteins within them. For example, someone who already has it might receive a graft of skin or organ that would carry the kreutzfeldt jakob disease and that would then spread throughout the new host. Over time, this goes throughout the body and lead to severe problems. If it gets to the brain, you're done. In most cases, death will occur well within a year, often months, and the process of dying is cruel. Prion diseases occur when normal proteins found in cells, skin, everything, become abnormally changed. They require a specific shape to function, and when they don't hold that shape, they begin to clump together. In the brain, this can cause a lot of damage, especially when you look at the brain in other diseases. In order to function properly, the brain has to have clear lines of communication between the neurons. These transmit signals. The signals allow it to achieve intended results. One part of the brain communicating with another to coordinate movement of the arm, ensure smooth movement, and ultimately achieving what you want, opening of a hand, pushing of something, writing a letter, so on. The impairment in the brain makes this impossible to a certain extent, and while we don't exactly know why prion diseases have this effect, we do know that that is what happens, and will generally lead to death. Interfering with certain parts of the brain is nearly always fatal. As a comparison, consider Alzheimer's disease. We see a similar buildup of proteins in the brain. This is also causing brain damage through communication and functional abnormalities. Like Alzheimer's disease, prion disease is not curable. In fact, it's almost always a one-way street leading to death. Some medicines can help to slow down that progress, but it's nearly always a process of risk management, putting those who are at most risk of acquiring a prion disease in a safe environment and, if they do acquire it, keeping them safe and comfortable in what is tantamount to palliative care. And this will get more and more serious as time progresses and they are more and more debilitated by the prion disease. Although there is variation between the various prion diseases, and we focused on one in particular with this video, they all share fundamental processes. In short, you have the prion protein, it becomes deformed. This creates the prion. Then it causes other possible pre-prion proteins to become deformed as well. This then creates a slow but sure spread of the disease, almost like cancer. If it gets into someone's brain, it can spread silently but in a deadly way for years. Eventually you begin to see symptoms, uncontrolled motions, changes in personality, and more. This is because the prions lead to the death of the neurons. Once this occurs, irreversible damage has been achieved. 
This then leads to a rapid decline in their brain function. You'll often see someone who's acquired a prion disease of some sort die within a few months. Sometimes it can take a few years, but that is one of the big problems. If you have a prion disease and you donate blood, for instance, or an organ, and aren't aware of the possible risks, you could possibly infect someone new. And this is what's happened with cannibalism. Cannibals unknowingly consume the flesh of those who were already infected, thereby becoming infected themselves. In the wider population, prion diseases are fairly rare. You only see one or two cases in every million people, and most of these die relatively quickly. They're only ever acquired in one of three ways, that being an acquired, otherwise something like exposure or consumption, much like HIV or AIDS is acquired, genetic, which is inherited, or sporadic through mutations. The greater risk for most people, when you consider all of the possible people who have a prion disease, is that which is acquired. There is always a risk that someone may either inherit it or develop a sporadic mutation. Either way, it points out the problem with consuming meat from sources that are either unregulated or possibly too closely related to a human. The exact way that the prion diseases came about in cattle is a video we want to cover in the future, but it is an interesting example of why certain products aren't safe. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions below.